What's up, everybody? Make some noise if you're happy to be here. <laughs> Authentic Church. And it's been sunny outside. Make some noise for that. No more rain. Rain, rain, go away. I am so glad to be with you. My name is Wayne. I serve as the lead pastor of Authentic Church, which is one church in two locations here in White Plains and Yonkers. Thank you for being with us. If it's your first time, we are super excited for you to join us in week two, the second installment of our Select Your Character series. And I've been helping people learn how to make daily choices to shape Christ-centered character. And so if you missed the last week's message, please get online and get caught up because I believe that regardless of where you land spiritually, this series is going to help you become a better Christian, and if you're not a Christian yet, it will help you become a Christian if you can just lean in and press into the material. So I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 15, setting up what we're going to go today. So Matthew chapter 15 is a very interesting passage. Let's read it here. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. And Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children to throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. And he said, dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Father, we thank you that we get to come together and listen to your word and to apply it to our lives. And today I'm asking you to give me some extra and special help to communicate that with clarity and with conviction and with comfort, God. I believe that today this message can help us all grow spiritually. So, Lord, help us to align our hearts and our minds to what you'd like to communicate. And let us leave this audience today transformed and changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Have you ever noticed how easily offended people are nowadays? Like legit, like people are so stinking offended by everything. Like they wake up in the morning and say, what can offend me today? Let me find that. <laughs> We're in a culture where innocent jokes have died, innocent comments have led to serious indictments. Chances are many of us in this room today are living offended. In fact, many of you are here today because the last church that you used to go to offended you. So you left that one and said, let me see if they'll offend me at this one. Some of us today are offended because you scroll through your Instagram or your Facebook and you notice that you weren't invited to that party, that lunch, that event that everybody was having fun at, but they didn't get the note to you and now you're offended. You've unfollowed everybody that you know on social media because you're offended. Perhaps social media is the reason why that we're living more offended than ever before and we are more offensive because now we have an electronic pulpit to tell everybody in the world how offended we are. Offended that somebody said Merry Christmas to you and you're Jewish. <laughs> offended that Starbucks has a red cup which implicates that they may be celebrating Christmas. Offended that somebody didn't say hi to you in the hallway. Offended that your co-worker didn't bring lunch and brought lunch to everybody else at your job. I can remember preaching a series a couple of years ago during the political race, and it was not a political message at all, but I made a statement that offended some people at our church. Five families left our church, not without telling everybody on Facebook why you shouldn't go back to Authentic Church because of something I said during the heightened tension of our political race. People are offended if a particular organization supports a cause. They're offended if you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, or if I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, I'm offended. Some of you are sitting in this audience right now, and you're saying, I'm not offended by anything. I'm not easily offended. That's 
because you're the one that's offending all the rest of us. You're the one getting on our nerves and getting us offended. Some people are even offended that you get offended. This is the culture that we live in. And so sometimes we have to break open that ancient fortune cookie of sorts, the book of Proverbs. <laughs> it's got all these sentences that help us grow spiritually. And in Proverbs chapter 18 and 19, because we're a culture of offense, have you ever noticed when your friends get offended how hard it is to win them back? Well, an offended friend here is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. That's in your Bible. And that's why we struggle in relationships. We live in a world where it's offensive to state your specific values or your beliefs if it's not consistent with the cultural ethos. So if I don't agree with something, all of a sudden I'm a bigot. <laughs> I'm into hatred. I'm, I'm into inequality when that's not always the case. The problem with us is that we're not having conversations. And now our offenses cause us to lose friends and to build fences. We're, we're losing friends because we're more offended than ever, and we're building fences that separate us from growing. So today, this is going to be the most important, perhaps, message in the entire series. This message has implications to help you grow spiritually in ways that you never, ever thought. Here's the big question to frame where we're going to go today. As Christians, what should offend us? And how, as Christians, can we be less offensive to everybody else around us? What would it look like if we could live our lives less offended and less offensive to others? And if we're going to do that, we have to select a character. We have to look at the character of Jesus Christ. His character is perfect, and we learn so much if we pair in deeper. In the New Testament book called Mark, we learn about the time that Jesus was being scourged and beaten, spat upon, and criticized before he was crucified. And at this time, we read that the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they're bringing against you? But here it is. Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. He said, aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges? And he said, nothing much to Pilate's surprise. Now, the one that's getting beaten up, the one that's getting spat upon, the one that's getting all of the accusations that are false put against him, he doesn't say anything at all. He doesn't say a word. Now, think about this. Jesus had the right to look back at Pilate and say, hey, bro, do you know how much money I've saved the Roman government, how many people I healed? Your health care plan owes me money. But Jesus doesn't say anything. He's quiet. Even though there's false and unjust accusations flying around, the only thing he did was go about and do good. And when he was accused of doing wrong, Jesus was silent. This is one of the hardest things for all of us to do when we're offended. But one of the ways that you can grow spiritually today is when you're offended, shut up. Don't say anything. Be silent, whether that's your spouse, whether that's your coworker, whether that's a family member, or whether that's a friend. Sometimes when people hurt us, we depend too much on getting affirmed by them in a particular way. And sometimes you just need to shut up. Don't say a word. Be silent. You would grow. Because here in the text, Jesus knew something that we often don't know. Jesus knew the scriptures. So he knew how to react. Because Isaiah, that Old Testament prophet, said he was oppressed, looking at the Messiah down through the annals of history. He says he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before his sharers, he did not open his mouth. Jesus was acquainted with the prophecies about himself. And we're going to learn something. So when we're offended, the first way that we can react and respond is to just shut up and be silent. It's tough, but it works. But in Mark, we also read a different reaction to offense. At one point, Jesus came and saw that the temple, the place where the power of God was represented, and it was the, the place that the Jewish people would come to honor the Lord, had been converted into nothing more than a big mall. And Jesus was really upset. 
He came in and he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus was upset that the house of God was turned into nothing more than a Christian uh, mall of sorts. It wasn't a Christian mall yet, but it was, a, it was a mall. People were selling things to others and selling sacrifices that would be offered later for exorbitant prices. And what was happening was that the poor was being over oppressed and Jesus was upset that the purpose of God's house was perverted and so he reacted he started turning over tables he started driving out the money changers apparently there are times when the faithful response of people that have received offensive behavior or see offensive behavior is to call it out publicly or with strong words of action. The problem with too many Christians today is that we're offended about things that we always voice and we're silent about the things that we should be offended about and not voicing those things. And yeah, you can clap for that. Two people over here like that. That's great. I'm offended. The rest of you haven't. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you have to speak out and take action against unjust systems that hold people down systematically in education and religion and corporate America. When people are systematically, particularly vulnerable people like the ones in the text that were poor being manipulated, we need to speak up. But here's what we see happening in both instances. Jesus is making a decision based upon Scripture. He's basing his decisions on reacting on Scripture. And in the Bible, Jesus, for 10% of everything Jesus says in the New Testament, he's quoting Scripture. You see, something has to guide the way that we make decisions. Christians often overlook this, and it's because we all need a steady diet of God's Word. And I'm going to help you today. This is the best message. I feel so excited. It's good stuff. I love sometimes to read the King James version of the text because I get to memorize it much easier because the language is a lot more clunky than our contemporary language. And I'm going to help you grow spiritually today. Here it is. Psalm 119 and 165 says it this way. Great peace have they which love thy law, your word. Great peace have they, and nothing shall offend them. <laughs> I'm going to, people that love God's word. People that love his law, great peace they have, and nothing shall offend them. Now, first, let me tell you what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that people aren't going to say and do things that offend us. It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that this won't destroy us. So, so what is Psalm 119 trying to say? The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And the implications of that word mean safety, that there's this idea of not just peace, but this idea of you, you, you're safe. And then the word in the text that is translated for uh, the, 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 the word offense is actually a word that means stumbling block, that, that there's a stumbling block or it provides safety from falling. Are you tracking with where I'm going here in the text? And so the other translation that you need to look at is the New Living where it says, those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. In other words, if you are offended, if you love God's word, if you know his law, you're not going to get tripped up until you're at the point of where you can't forgive and you can't develop a great life with God. Here's what I want to get across to you today. We're less offended when we read God's word more often. We're less offended when we read God's word more often. And today, this has all of the potential to free your spiritual life in a big, big way. Because the truth of the matter is, Christians in North America have the most anemic relationship with studying. I know you come to church, but most of us barely read our Bibles. I, I know you listen to your favorite preacher on your podcast, but do you interact with your Bible by yourself? I'm going to push you a little bit further. I'm going to say not only do you read your Bible, do you study your Bible? Okay, you're, uh, let me see if I can really offend you. Do, do you memorize scripture from the Bible? Because you do not believe what you cannot retrieve. And the reason why many of us are not growing and you're grumpy is because you don't know God's word. And you're expecting this screen to tell you God's word every week. Instead of telling yourself, I'm going to interact with it every day. So let me give you a practical application to help you grow. Here it is. 
You got to develop a habit of reading God's word frequently. Oh, you, you got to develop a habit of reading God's word frequently. See, if Christians read the word more often, they would know that the Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. So when your wife is getting at you and she's getting on your case and you're saying, and you want to lash back and clap back, you would know that you need to say, yes, honey. A soft answer turns away wrath and keeps your marriage going for many, many years. Somebody say amen. I heard great preaching right there. <laughs> if you knew God's word, you know that Romans 14 tells us that we should pursue the things which make for peace and the building of one another up. In other words, we wouldn't be divisive when we're offended. We would seek reconciliation and we would seek to make relationships work. If you knew the Bible, you would know that there is one who speaks rashly according to Proverbs, like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Why? Because the condition of the soul is always at the tip of our tongues. And the only way we get wise is when we increase our interaction with God's word. If you knew God's word, you would know Psalm 37. When you get offended, you'd know Psalm 37, which says, the wicked will die. Okay. <laughs> I had to make you laugh a little bit. Let me say something to you. The reason why most of us are so easily offended is because we've made reading, studying, and memorizing God's word optional. You're a Christian, but your habit of reading the Bible is optional. So how do we reduce offense? Well, we start reading God's word more frequently. Look, this is not a cult, okay? We're not giving anybody any. I know that during the summer, we're going to dip. You guys will be here a little bit. You might come once a month. You might come twice if you're really holy and spiritual. If you are close to Jesus, it'll be three times a month. If you are really wanting to go to heaven, you'll be here four times a month, right? Like, but... but but here, we're not a cult. I want you to go on vacation. I want you to have a great time. I want you to rest. Then I want you to come back this fall ready to go after it, inviting your friends and so on. So I'm not against you not being here on Sunday. If you're in town, come to church. If you're out of town, be out of town, right? But don't be away from your Bible. One person, everybody else is offended like... No, don't, don't get away from your Bible. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Get in your word. Get a Bible app called YouVersion. Download it. Get on a 90-day Bible reading plan. Get yourself in a week-to-week -week Bible reading rhythm every day. Now I'm going to challenge you a little bit further. You need to, this summer, memorize a scripture. Memorize a passage. Memorize two verses. See, I'm looking at you. You guys are quiet. I know I'm preaching good now. But memorize a scripture because the problem is, is that we interact with the word, but we don't really know it that well. All right? So, so let me get back to the reason why I read that text at the beginning of the message. Has anybody ever ignored you? Like you ask them something and they ignored you. Isn't that the worst feeling on the planet? Whether that's asking somebody for the remote control or to get you some more juice or something, something really important and they just ig you. In this text, we see that this woman comes and approaches Jesus and says, hey, my daughter needs help. Can you help me? And Jesus gives her no reply. Not even a word, the Bible says. And then the disciples are telling her to go away. She's bothering us with all of her begging. I mean, I read this text and I'm like, Jesus, where are your manners, bro? Didn't Mary teach you better than that to respond to people? And then the disciples are like, I'm so offended. Oh, my God. She's like over here asking us for stuff. We're going to have to get some legislation against this woman. She's begging. And then Jesus says to the woman, hey, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. He basically says, look, I'm not here to serve you. You're not one of us. I, I, you're not here. I'm not here to serve you. That's offensive. Most of us would be really upset. Jesus is saying, my priority is not this, and I've got to do something else. Let me help you grow spiritually. One of the ways you grow spiritually is when you don't get offended by other people being attached and clear about their priorities. Just because they don't match your priorities doesn't mean that you need to be offended. Now, i got to be honest. I'm working through this myself, okay? This is not something I'm, not, I'm fully through yet. I mean, 
Just the other day, I have staff. Pastor Jim is one of my staff members, and it was after hours. I like to work. I got Jamaican all up in my blood. I like to work, man. I'm just working. And it was after work hours, and I texted him, and I asked him something about, uh, you know, something at work, and he didn't reply. (laughs) How dare you? Did not reply at all. Not even the next day. So he came into work all happy, like, hey. And I was just sitting behind my desk like, what's up, bro? All day, staff lunch, didn't want to sit close by him, didn't want to talk by him. I was turned, and I was tight, glutes like this, tight. (laughs) I was offended. He didn't respond. So eventually during the day, I said, hey, bro, I asked you about something for work yesterday. You didn't respond to my text. He said, it was date night. (laughs) So? (laughs) I don't care about Heather or your kids. (laughs) He was like, it was my date night. I said, you're worried about date night. Now you need to be worried about payday. How about that? (laughs) Here's how you grow spiritually. You cannot get offended when people have clear boundaries, when they know their priority. Jesus said, this is my priority. You have to somehow deal with that and figure out how do I keep my priorities consistent and sometimes how do I adjust my priorities to still accomplish what I want to accomplish. Here's what she did in the text. She came and worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Because worship is an act of humility. It was a beautiful thing that she did. And here's the second way you grow spiritually, and that is to worship Jesus when you feel offended. So many of us stop worshiping when we feel offended instead of pressing into praise and pressing into worshiping our God. Why? It takes our focus off of our hurt and we lunge it onto a God that's able to care for us well. are, Are you hearing me? Instead of talking about how much her daughter was suffering and accusing Jesus of being uncaring, what does this woman do? She worships, and so many of us lose our worship when we get offended. And here's what Jesus does. He takes it further. He says, it isn't right for me to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Whoa. Imagine how many of us would have responded. We'd be like, I don't care if you're the son of God. Girl, hold my earrings. Taking out nose rings. Get the Vaseline, girl. I'm going in. I may be a Canaanite, but I'm going in, right? We wouldn't care if it was the son of God. If we're from Brooklyn, Amherst, from Queens, we're going in, right? She doesn't do that here because she's listening. And if you're going to grow spiritually and if you're not going to be offended, you have to listen. Now, in that day, they would always call people that were non-Jews dogs. But they would talk about Cujo kind of dogs, like mangy dogs. Jesus uses a different word in the Greek. He uses a word that means more like little dog like, or, or like a puppy, a house pet. It's a much softer word that she would not be used to a Jew using. In other words, it would be like calling her like a little Yorkie or something like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I have a Yorkie. That's not mine. I hate mine. This one is... Uh, <laughs> But this one is I. And, um, and, and so he's saying, hey, he, he actually softened the language. So there was already something that she was listening to. Now think about this too. He also said, I am called to the lost sheep. That is not a compliment either. Sheep are dumb. And not only that, he's saying that they're lost. He's comparing both of them to not impressive animals. Jesus' disciples are trying to get rid of her. Everybody's trying to push her away. And I can guarantee you that there might have been a lot of hurt from many of us. But she replies, that's true, Lord. But even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Wow. That's worship. She could have got upset and said, oh, you're full of Jewish privilege. And Canaanite lives matter. Church is good today. I don't care what nobody got to say. Church, church good today. He could have, she could have organized a rally on Jerusalem 
got all upset, but she does something. She worships because she's consistent with her priority, even though somebody else has identified. She refuses to be offended. You see, in our culture, everybody wants voice at the table. I want to be at the table to discuss this. I want to be at the table to make power changes and so on. And in God's kingdom, it's not about being at the table. Sometimes it's about being under the table. That when you lower your own priorities, God seems to exalt people that are not always trying to be in the position of power, but are more, consi- more consistent with being in a, po- a position of submission. And maybe for some of us today, the, the place that you need to be is under the table, not just at the table. God wants to grow you spiritually, and here's what he said, dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. What if our faith could get greater so that our requests could be granted. What what if we could be least offended and less offensive to everybody else because for so many of us in this room, we're offensive to other people because we just say what we want to and we think what we want to and we just blurt it out and we need to be more concerned about how we impact the world. Here's what Proverbs 19 and 11 says. Good sense makes one slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Oh, let, let me tell you something. One of the reasons why we can't get really free in worship Because when we are offended, it might even affect our offerings. Jesus says, hey, don't even come and worship me until you take care of offense. Leave your gift at the altar. Go back and make it right and then come and worship me. Some of us are not growing in our worship lives because you've offended somebody that you haven't apologized to. And maybe God wants to grow you spiritually by just saying the two most powerful words that you can sometimes in the entire universe. And that is, I am sorry. We're less offended when we read God's word more often. My friend Scott Sauls describes our intoxication with offense as outrage porn. (laughs) We're just outraged by everything. I can't believe he said that. I can't believe she wore that. I can't believe he did that. We're just so offended by everything. And I'm growing spiritually in this area. This weekend, one of my dearest, closest friends in all of my life, uh, I had to work through some stuff. His daughter, I was supposed to be in Texas this weekend, not today. I was supposed to be flying back yesterday to be here today. But his daughter asked me to marry them. And I thought, what an honor. One of my closest friends asked, his daughter asked me to marry them and to do their marriage counseling. And, um, yeah, it was like a big honor. So I met with this couple via FaceTime and Zoom calls and You know, the first couple of weeks, I was really consistent with helping them with their premarital counseling and whatnot. But then, man, things got real around here. And things got real with my family. And things got real with leading our church. And I just couldn't make the calls as much as I wanted to. And I couldn't show up to certain time references that they needed me for. And it was just tough. I'm just going to be real. And then one day, she called me up, and she fired me. (laughs) She's like... I'm going to have to get another pastor to do our premarital counseling and to uh, marry us. And da da da. She was really kind and soft. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. You're not firing me. No, girl, you need to get canceled. I was, I, I was thinking of ways I could have turned it around on her. Like, yeah, yeah, well, I wasn't going to be able to do it anyways. And I was going to call you and tell you too. Like, you know, I was going to end it anyways. And I couldn't because she had a priority and it was misaligned with mine. So I had a decision. And the funny thing is, for months before this, I have been praying, God help me to be the least offended person on the planet. Because to be a successful pastor, man, I'm telling you, you got to be a person that's not offended easily. Because people leave and they do things and they say things and it's hard, man, sometimes. So here's what all of us need. We need to ask God to give us thicker skin and thinner hearts. (laughs) We, We need thick skin and a thin heart. And so I let her go get married by who she needed to get married. I was looking on Instagram, you know, just yesterday, wondering if I should like her photos. (laughs) Might be endorsing something like I approve of that. But I decided I'm not going to be offended. In fact, I'm going to send her a gift. It's going to be from Walmart, but I'm going to send her a gift. (laughs) 
you were going to get a check. You were going to get some money. Now you may get a toaster. <laughs> Might not be Hamilton Beach even, but you're going to get a toaster. L let me bring the gospel into this. Here's the reason why we need to be least offended people in your marriage, in our communities, in our cities, in our jobs. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, while we were still offending God, while we were still saying offensive things, while we were still doing things that offended the heart of God, God forgave us by giving his only son to forgive all of our offenses. And if God will forgive all of our offenses while we're still doing them, can you cut other people some slack? The truth is, God loves us so much that he's covered our offenses. And the Bible teaches that love covers a multitude of offenses. The good news is that none of our works, none of our abilities, none of our performance, none of our righteousness can ever impress God. The good news is that because of Jesus Christ, God the Father has taken away our offenses never to see them again. And what I'm saying to you, that is better than just good news. It is the greatest news in the universe that will liberate your life. So what do you need to do? Get your head outside of TMZ every single day and get it into the scriptures. Don't tell me you don't have enough time. You make time for what you value. And what you value, you make time for. Most of us, and here's the thing, God's not against you having values, like things that you want to do, the gym, hanging out with friends, going to the coffee. God's not against that. God's saying, prioritize me. Seek the kingdom of God first, and then all the other stuff adds. And for many of us, interacting with the Bible just once every two weeks, casual little reading here and there, is not enough to help you grow spiritually. You are going to die spiritually. Can I be bold with you? You are going to die spiritually if you do not read God's word. I'm going to push it further. You cannot know God outside of his word. So, <laughs> in order for you to know who God is, you're going to, and I don't care if you're 15. I don't care if you're 29. Wherever you land, there is scripture for you that's going to help you grow. Are you hearing me, everybody? This might be the best message you hear all month. We need to grow spiritually. And here's how you do it. We're less offended when we read God's word more often. So develop a habit of reading God's word frequently. And worship Jesus when you feel offended. God, I feel, I feel offended. This person said something, so I worship you. Take away the offense, like how you took away my sins. God, I know I've offended you. I might have offended you with my thoughts today, with my actions, with that thing that I looked at, I logged on. I did. God, thank you for forgiving me of my offense. In the same way that you forgave me, let me reciprocate that to people. Thank you for listening. We'd love for you to join us live at one of our gatherings. We also have life groups that meet all across Westchester so that you can make new friends and grow spiritually. For more information or prayer, please contact us at info at Until next time, live for real.